Hello, my name is David Hines, and I want to say on the front end, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not an epidemiologist, but I am a modeler. I've worked with models for many, many years. And what I've done here is built a model to try to understand COVID, the different kinds of numbers we're seeing, the different kinds of charts. And I want to use this model to answer four questions. You can see them in the upper left there. Number one, why does social distancing matter so much? Number two, why does testing matter so much? Number three, why should we think about COVID more as a wildfire than a wave? And number four, is it okay for some states to open up right now? So to understand COVID, the key number to understand is what's called R0, or it's kind of the contagion factor. You can see it right here on the screen. Um, the R0 contagion factor for COVID is thought to be probably about 2.2, maybe between two and two and a half. And what this is, this is the average number of people that become infected after you've become infected that you might infect. So for example, if I become infected today, I'm probably going to be contagious for about a week. So over this coming week, if the 2.2 is right, it means I'm going to infect 2.2 people during that week. And to see the effect of that, you can come down here into the basic part of the model. So the model shows every week, starts the first week, which is January 15th. And this is, this is initially based in New York City. And, and, and in that week, it was thought there might have been a couple of hundred people infected that came in, say, mostly from Europe. So those 200 people in that week, with an R0 of 2.2, they infect 440 people. And then at the end of that week, they're no longer contagious, but then the 440 infect another 2.2 per person, and that creates 968 people who are infected, and so forth. And of course, you can see the pattern here week to week. Um, this is that exponential growth that has been talked about a lot uh, that results from these kind of uh, viral infections. Now, to put it in, in perspective, um, again, COVID's R0 is thought to be about 2.2. The most uh, contagious virus is uh, measles, which is about 3.3. Uh, the Spanish flu back in 1918, they're not sure, but it might have been as high as 2.8. But the seasonal flu that we hit every year is uh, closer to 1.3. But as you're going to see, the difference between 1.3 and 2.2 is gigantic. So let's see why, why this is so important, why you need to understand N0. Well, so again, this model here, I'm kind of to replicate New York City. So we've got a population of 10 million. In January 15th, there was, say, 200 seed infections that came in from the outside. And then based on the model parameters, this is how uh, things progressed. And you see the chart over here of daily deaths. And this tracks pretty closely. You know, we're, here we are right now in April 22nd, right around here, just past the peak. Uh, the maximum daily deaths, according to my model, would be 718, and that's roughly where New York City has been running, starting to come down. Um, this shows 85% of their bed capacity at that maximum point being used. Um, and it does show that by the time we get to May 27th, there may be somewhere in the range of 35,000 deaths in New York City. Now, it may not be that much, but uh, the model is showing that. And... Uh, Again, these are not exact numbers. I, I'm not meaning to project what's going to happen specifically in New York City. I'm just trying to kind of show that the model is a reasonable representation of what's actually happening. So in New York City, starting off in January, they really took no action. So the 2.2 was the R0, continuing into February. But come March, that's when they realized they really had to crack down and begin social distancing. Now, when you social distance, what happens is the R0 goes down. So if you normally are going to infect, say, two people during your one week of being contagious, um, when you social distance, you're not in contact with so many people. And so the R0 might go from two to one, or it might even go below one. 
And below one's a critical number because below one is when actually the whole virus starts shutting down. Problem is it's hard to keep it below one. We're, uh, that's a really extreme social distancing, but I'm showing that as of right now, uh, the most extreme social distancing where the people really are staying indoors in New York City. Now, in this model going forward, I'm projecting that come about a month from now, May 27th, um, they'll begin to ease off. And so the, the, it's social distancing. So a contagion factor will rise back up to, say, 1.1, which is where it was in mid-March. So if that were the case, and they hold that for the whole year, then the additional deaths after May 27th are only 1,700. Still a big number, but at least it's manageable. Now, what happens, though, if we go from 1.1, let's say we even allow a little more activity so that it goes to 1.2. Let's see what happens to the deaths. It goes from 1,700, 60, 2,300 for the remainder of the year. Still not horrible. Let's go to 1.3. Deaths go to 4,700. All right, it's starting to creep up, and you see the curve. You're not seeing a resurgence, but you are seeing some continued increased deaths. Let's go to 1.4. Okay, now you notice the tail of the curve popped up there. And now we're at 12,000 deaths. So at 1.4, that's kind of a tipping point. At that point, it's really starting to make a serious difference. 1.5, now you see a real surge. 1.6. The surge coming in the fall would be even greater than the surge that we've experienced uh, so far. So you can see how important R0 is, and R0 is the thing that we try to get down with social distancing. Now, the problem is we don't really know where that tipping point is. We don't know whether it means people can go to restaurants, people can have uh, go to sports events, uh, how, you know, how many people have to wear masks, not wear masks. All those are, are, this is our first time through with us, so we really don't know. Um, so opening up will be a kind of trial and error process. And the reason testing is so important is because testing will let us see what's happening and react more quickly if we've overshot. So in this case, let's say we did in New York City go to 1.6, whatever that means. It's not the full 2.2 that they were before. So it's still some distancing, but not, not as bad. So they go to 1.6, and then without testing, they, it takes until they start seeing deaths going up in August to say, oops, come, come uh, August 5th, uh-oh, we better cut back down. So we're going to come back down to 1.1. And you see what happens. It, it definitely flattened the curve. Um, and now you have 9,000. 134 deaths after May 27th for the rest of the year. But if you had testing, and let's say you could find out four weeks earlier before the deaths are hitting, you could have a good idea of when there was a surge coming again. So if by July we knew that and we went to 1.1 there, the deaths dropped to 3,500. So basically, um, the testing in this situation and this example saved us over 5,000 deaths in New York City. Uh, that's why testing is so important. Now, let's talk about the idea of COVID being a wildfire. And uh, to do that, we have to talk about herd immunity. You've probably heard that term. The idea is that as people become infected and they recover, they are, for the most part, immune. Now, we don't know this for sure. We don't know how long it lasts, but, you know, the history with viruses and the history with this virus seems to show that that's true, at least for this year. So um, what happens is with herd immunity, and we can go here. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to reset this to, uh, let's say, 1.8 but let it run the whole way. So what this is saying is, uh, well, in New York City, just for argument's sake, um, it wasn't quite as bad of infection rate, but we didn't really do much about it. And you see what happens here is, here's the percent of the population infected, and it goes up really rapidly. So by, really by May, 76% of the population has now been infected. 
Now that's of course a bad thing because those infections uh, are creating deaths. So we had between the before and after May 27 deaths, we've had 158,000 deaths. That's like twice the normal annual deaths from all causes in New York City. But let's see what's actually happening when we come down here week to week. So early on, when those are initial 200 with an R naught of 180, they infected 360 people, and then those 360 went to 648, etc. But watch what happens. This is an, this is herd adjusted. So I'm going to come over here to the percent infected column, and you can see as more people are getting infected by this point in mid-March, almost 2% of the population in New York City were infected according to this model. And what that does is it actually provides a kind of discount. So the 1.8 actually becomes 1.78 because there's just 2% fewer people that are able to be infected. So that reduces the infection rate. And in this situation, in this scenario, in the model here, of course, it goes like very rapidly. So by May, half the people, a little more than half, are infected. And again, that creates a lot of deaths, which is bad, but it does provide a nice discount actually right here so that you're basically getting half of the 1.8. So the effective end naught is 0.87. There's just fewer people that can be infected. And again, once you get below one, you're starting to shut down the whole virus. So, so you can see this idea that it grows like a wildfire, that COVID does. And the way to think about the uninfected population is to think of it as dry tinder. So early on, when almost there was basically everybody was susceptible, you had the dry tender and just a perfect condition for it to take off like a rocket ship. But as the more and more of the people burned, as more and more of the people became infected, there was less for the fire to spread with. As you know, in a wildfire, it, it blasts through and burns most everything. And then if you try to light it again, it's, you're not going to get very far because all the combustible material has been burned already. And that's the same idea with infected people. So we'll, we'll see in a minute why I feel it's so important to think of it as a wildfire rather than a wave. Um, and of course a vaccine will do the same thing, but, of course, but you know the thought is we're not going to see one this year. But a vaccine is like um, in the wildfire analogy would be like uh, putting fire retardant on half the trees if half the people became vaccinated. So it has the same kind of effect of really dampening that R naught. Now, let me address this idea of can, states open, can the states open up right now? Can some states open up? Well, first of all, these are smaller states that say, oh, we're not New York. So let me go, let me bring it on down to a million population and 20 um, initially infected, okay, in January. Now, uh, what I should have done, let me go back here a second. Take a look at the uh, bed capacity. We're at 493% at the maximum point. Very bad, right? Let's say we're only a million, though, and 20 infected. Same 493%, same curve, same timing, same everything. It's just scaled down, but smaller communities have fewer beds. So in terms of percentage bed capacity, you're still overloading your, your healthcare system. So being smaller doesn't help. You get the same surge on a relative basis. But how about if you say, well, wait a minute, we're less dense. We're rural, a lot of rural areas. Okay. So instead of 1.8, all right, maybe we'll bring that down to 1.5. And let's see what happens. Okay. So we're now down to 246% bed capacity. So it's not as bad, but it's still a giant surge, right? You're still overloading your healthcare system. 
and you are delaying it a bit. The peak here is at week 28 versus before the peak was at week 22. All right, so let's say, um, take it down even more. Let's take it down to where the flu normally is, 1.3. You still have the surge. It's not as bad, but it's still bad, 108%. You still have more deaths, equal the number of deaths normally from all causes. And But now you've extended it out to week 38. Actually, based on this, out in September. Get back to 1.5. So being less dense, it does reduce the surge somewhat, but it's still a bad surge and it delays it. And what if you say, well, yeah, but we, you know, it started on the coast and it didn't hit us till mid-March. We didn't get our first cases. So let's change this to March 15th. The curve didn't change at all. All that changed were the dates. <laughs> so all you're doing is you're just changing, you're just delaying it by two months. The same stuff happens, it's just going to happen later by two months. Um, now, now you might say, well, okay, but we're stopping, you know, these people from coming in. We're being very careful of checking them coming in from other states and other countries. Okay. So let's say the 20 actually became two. Again, look at your capacity, 246% capacity. Look what happened. Same thing, same surge, same number of deaths. It's just, you've delayed it again. You know, now we're out at week 34, so you've delayed it by another six weeks. So, for example, stopping China from coming here, that does buy us time. But it doesn't change the search, unless you use that time that you bought to take some actions. So, this is why I say it's really dangerous for especially some of the smaller states in the middle of our country or anywhere for that matter that are saying well we don't have so many cases we've we've ducked the wave well the thing is it's not a wave it's more like a wildfire and um, you're still have a lot of dry tinder most of your people are not infected and that's good that you haven't had deaths but it's bad because you're still dry tinder so you think of it like a wildfire that is going to come you can see from these simulations unless you do take precautions. So uh, those are the key points I wanted to make. I, again, I'm not, I want to repeat, I'm not an epidemiologist. Um, I would welcome any experts to challenge any of this. And uh, so please take it with a grain of salt, but I do believe at least from a general modeling standpoint that these are all uh, accurate conclusions. Uh, so in summary, I guess the bad news is um, Right now, our herd immunity is still pretty low. It's possible in New York it may be up to 15%, but uh, probably in the middle of the country, it's in the very, very low digits. Um, as long as that herd immunity is low and we don't have a vaccine, which is not coming until next year, we're going to have to keep being careful. we got to keep that R not below the tipping point. So it doesn't mean we can't loosen up you know we can maybe loosen up or we can loosen up but we have to do it in a smart way because if we get close to and past that tipping point we're it's going to really cost us lives as you saw in that new york city example just buying four weeks of early detection saved five thousand lives in that scenario um the good news is though that uh while a uh, vaccine probably isn't coming till next year, we could see a therapeutic drug, which would be something like a Tamiflu, but say for coronavirus, like a Tamico. <laughs> and um, so the idea is that if you do get the virus and you took this therapeutic drug, presuming that it would work very well, it would keep you from getting really, really sick and needing to go to the hospital and, and dying. And if that were the case, then in effect, we could treat this more like we do the flu and come on out of the house and do what we've done before. And if you get sick, you take the, the drug and you know, you're okay. So short of a vaccine, that could be a great answer for this, this year. We don't know. Anyway, I didn't want to leave you on, uh, on a bad note. Thanks very much. I hope this was useful.